Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bhartia and welcome to TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us once again Gaurav Rishi, VP of Product at Cast and by Veeam. Gaurav, it's great to have you back on the show. Sapnil, great to be back here. Thank you very much. Kasten has announced Kasten 10.4.5 Kubernetes data management platform. Before we talk about this specific release, I want to talk a bit about Kasten 10. Can you talk about what specific problem are you trying to solve for the Kubernetes users with it? Kubernetes is a young and growing ecosystem, so it's extremely dynamic. Um, so it comes with some teething problems, uh, and customers definitely want to make sure simplicity to get your data workloads in production is something that is as seamless as possible. So, you know, Casten by Veeam's mission really is to go ahead and make sure that we are helping these enterprises confidently run their application on Kubernetes by facing these data management challenges head on. And so specifically, you know, the three use cases that we focus on and do really well is Kubernetes backup and recovery. We also support disaster recovery and application mobility, whether it's Kubernetes applications between Kubernetes versions, uh, as you go ahead and back up and rehydrate your application, the versions could change, or it could be across clusters or even hybrid environments. So those three use cases between backup, disaster recovery, and application mobility in the context of Kubernetes is really what Kasten lives and breathes on. Great, now let's talk about what's new in 4.5 release. Lots of, uh, lots of new things. Um, and so, you know, I'll try and sort of keep it simple uh, in terms of at least giving you the top three themes. Um, you know, before I jump into that, I'll just take a step back. I think, uh, Sopna, when we talked about last time um, and we were talking about casting 4.0 back in May, we talked a lot about the fact that ransomware is a scourge and we had started getting um, a lot of custom requests, you read about this in the news all the time about ransomware attacks across the organization. And so Kasten became the first organization to be able to protect your uh, Kubernetes applications and be able to recover from them. So, so that was the centerpiece of our um, release in the 4.0 timeframe. Not only have we gone ahead and done some ecosystem innovations to increase the ransomware protection support across not just Amazon S3, but a variety of object stores that could be on premises, whether it's MinIO or Cloudian or Scality, et cetera. Um, number two, we've actually gone ahead and improved our out-of-the-box experience. And this is hits on the point you are making, which is there's so many knobs to turn and simplicity is um, at the forefront of everybody's mind. So the way we have gone ahead and made sure that it's not only an easy to install and bring up your Cast and K10 application, but it comes bundled with a lot of goodies in terms of being able to get a view of what the dashboard looks like, get a quick view in terms of what are the applications which are not protected, what are the backups that might have failed and be able to drill down into it. So out of the box experience, but still allowing people to make it extensible so it can integrate into that cloud native workflows is theme number two. And third, actually as exciting, is we are going ahead and um, seeing Kubernetes growth go into the edge. So we are seeing lightweight Kubernetes distributions like K3 come up, and we've also gone ahead and added support for not just supporting Kubernetes environments in the cloud, in primary data centers, but now deeper into the edge. So those are the key three themes that um, maybe talk about the way we innovate, but of course we can get into the details. I want to go back to extensibility. If platforms tend to be opinionated, they can also lock users in. So talk a bit about how do you maintain the fine balance of creating a platform which makes things easier for users while also giving them freedom and flexibility without any risk of vendor lock-in? Let me try and address it in uh, two parts. Uh, the first part is what's unique about Kasten's approach to solving the problem. And I think freedom of choice from a customer's perspective is one of our core sort of tenets is uh, philosophically our design philosophy. So in, in, in some ways, what that translates to is that we are not a storage vendor. So we don't force people to go and say, you have to use this particular storage before you can do backup or recovery. We're not a Kubernetes distribution vendor, so we're not forcing customers to say, you must use this version of 
or this distribution of Kubernetes for you to be able to support it. And three, we are not even a database vendor, so we're not forcing uh, people to use that. So what we are in fact seeing is customers are exceedingly using the, uh, their applications in hybrid environments, multi-cloud, on-premises, with different clouds. And so the way Kasten approaches, which is philosophically very much in alignment with how Veeam approaches the uh, solution for data protection, is to allow you to have this wide ecosystem of choice to pick up your best storage solution, pick up your best Kubernetes distribution, pick up your best deployment model across these locations. So that's part one. Part two to your question about extensibility is while on one hand, like I said, we want to improve the out of the box experience and we've gone ahead and taken these next generation cloud native tools like Prometheus and Grafana and we're kind of creating dashboards so that you become productive just as soon as you install Cast and K10. We also realize that Look, people will have applications that require some level of um, you know, customization when it comes to backing it up because applications under the covers are microservices and multiple microservices in the cloud native world. And so when you're going ahead and backing it up or when you're recovering from it, maybe you want to go ahead and define the order of operations of saying, don't go and back up um, microservice two or when you're recovering, make sure microservice one is completely rehydrated before microservice two comes up. So those kind of extensible options is where Cast and Kten allows complete freedom of choice again to the customers or system integration partners by authoring blueprints independent of the Cast and Kten release. And this allows them to go ahead and move very fast, which is a requirement in today's world, to be able to use some of the blueprints that we've already created, but then also be able to modify or create new ones for a variety of data services, regardless of which cloud they're running on or which on-premises location they are at. So hopefully that gives you at least a top level overview. Let's quickly talk about security. I look at security from two aspects. One is of course technology and second is people. We can easily solve or we can easily address the technology aspect of security, but what about people aspect? Uh, but I, I, I want to talk about security from Kubernetes data management perspective, how different is security in this space as compared to, let's say, traditional security or traditional IT? Hmm. No, very good question. You're right. That, that, that's a good lens to look at it from in terms of both the operations and the human aspects. And you know, social engineering is usually one of the ways people exploit uh, security issues. And of course, the technology landscape has changed too. So. So both actually are different in the context of Kubernetes is first of all, the broad point I'll make. And the reason they're different is first of all, on the technology aspect of it, um, you know, you are now working in an environment where an application, like I said, is first of all, a lot more distributed. It's lots of different data services under the covers. Uh, you know, polyglot persistence is the you know, technical term we use to indicate that a single application under the covers might be using multiple databases to solve the job. It could be a time series database, it could be a managed data service like an Amazon RDS, and it could be Cassandra or even operator-based databases like Kate Sandra from Datastax, uh, which has been open sourced. So first of all, you have distributed application, which is always getting dynamically reallocated uh, to different physical nodes. And so your concept of parameter security or having just a data center security related approaches are completely different. Um, you know, you may not even have a virtual machine layer uh, and might be running bare metal in this context. So all the solutions in the security context, which try to solve it from that perspective are different. And third, from a technology perspective, a lot of the development, if I kind of, you know, rewind and start from there, might be using a lot of um, capabilities whether it's open source libraries or modules uh, from a variety of different vendors to build up these microservices. So the way you need to now dynamically keep scanning for critical vulnerabilities, et cetera, is very different in this environment than it used to be when you were creating uh, you know, traditional, maybe three tier or monolithic applications. So that's part one. On the part related to the operations and the human aspect of it, you know, you're exactly right. I think over permissioning during both the installation process as well as on the operation side of it and not having this, as uh, you know, privilege separation 
is one of the issues that uh, we see. And so from Caston K10's perspective, the way we uh, solve that problem is first of all, we as Caston K10 itself are very conscious of the surface area that we expose um, and we minimize it obviously. So as an example, when we are going ahead and installing in terms of let's say an AWS environment, we can take an assumed role. We are integrated as an IAM. We don't ask for you know, username, password type credentials. And we ourselves have gone through a fairly onerous process, both in like an AWS environment, or we are also Red Hat OpenShift operator certified, for example, to make sure that we ourselves are patched up. And in addition to that, have gone ahead and had ourselves scanned so that we don't have any vulnerabilities. And then from an operator perspective, we are well integrated into the Kubernetes RBAC system so that when a particular operations team member looks at the cast and Kate and console or uses an um, API access to try and do an operation, they are actually getting authorized and authenticated to make sure they can actually do that particular action. And they get a view of only their applications, not somebody else's application, even though they might be on the same Kubernetes cluster. So, so just by going ahead and having that deep integration and surfacing it sort of seamlessly helps avoid some of the human errors also. So um, I, I know it's a more involved topic, but uh, I think those are the two key aspects in addition to, of course, us being the last line of defense when it comes to things like ransomware recovery that truly makes us different and helps customers. Let's also talk about Edge. Well, first of all, you know, everybody defines Edge in their own way. When I talk about Edge, I'm looking at the Edge data centers, those far devices, which are resource constrained. Um, so let's talk about what kind of adoption of Edge are you seeing uh, as there are already uh, many lightweight Kubernetes distributions like Zero Case by Mirantes and K3S by Rancher and Sousa. And also what role is Kasten by Veeam playing in this space? No, so I think those are uh, good points. So first of all, to your point around um, Edge being an overloaded term, 100% agree with you. I think uh, one person's edge is another person's data center is the way I joke about it internally. Um, and um, I think from our perspective, having um, support for a variety of these options, because depending on the industry you're talking about, to answer your question about where is edge uh, in terms of production usage and adoption, it, uh, it depends uh, based on some of the industries and the use cases. So we are already, for example, seeing a lot of the telcos talk about uh, you know, going deeper into the network. You hear a lot in the press about 5G, et cetera. And all of those fall into the definition of edge. At the same time, you also talk about devices becoming more intelligent and you kind of get into these IoT type use cases. And that's really interesting. I think when you think about it at a uh, level where a lot of the hyperscalers are going further downstream and taking the Kubernetes distribution where it's not just available on the cloud, but actually on premises and premises could mean secondary and even unmanned data centers. It is another definition of the edge. And I think the point I'll make is across all these three points um, are examples of this. We are definitely seeing production use cases. In fact, uh, you know, even, even air-gapped examples of this where there might be floating ships in the ocean and they don't always have connectivity available but are running Kubernetes are, are examples that we actually, uh, you know, get to see. And um, to your question about how do we think about, um, you know, the key requirements in this particular context, and especially where you have variations in terms of the environments that you need to now communicate with, limited bandwidth, limited compute power, and um, also at the same time distributed environments where you have some processing going on in the data center and some or, or cloud and some in the edge. Um, in all of these cases, the key requirements that first of all we recognize and then tackle is that you need to be able to transform your application uh, dynamically. You can't expect people to change their application but for example, something that is running on a high performance compute node with the high performance flash storage in the, uh, store, in the data center needs to, for limited functionality, be able to run at an edge location. 
So what that requires is us to go ahead and transform the storage class, for example, or uh, you know, take care of some of the security parameters by aging out some of the certificates. And that's something that Casting K10 actually has been doing since um, version 2.5 with our transformation capabilities. But we've gone ahead and taken that and made sure that it also works with K3s, like you pointed out. We also actually announced uh, that we were launch partners for Amazon's EKS Anywhere, uh, which allows you to sort of go ahead and have EKS running on-prem. And um, this allows for a level of dynamism where we are seeing applications move to the edge and at times parts of the application move to the data center or cloud to go ahead and complete the you know, business problem of being able to process data. So, so that's how we actually go ahead and attack and identify this particular issue. This is a question that I've been wanting to ask for a very long time. Casting is now kind of part of Veeam. What kind of integration is there between technologies of these two companies? Yeah, no thanks, Swapna. Uh, th that's a good question. So uh, two parts to it. I think organizationally, Casting is a independent business unit, definitely a part of Veeam, and that's why we call ourselves Casting by Veeam, uh, and you sort of uh, introduced us that way. But we work extremely closely, cross-functionally, across sales, marketing, and definitely engineering to solve the key customer problems, like you pointed out, um, as, a, as a wider company. So one uh, part which I would like to highlight as a part of uh, Casting Kit and 4.5 announcement is um, you know, our integrations into VBR uh, version 11a uh, and higher. And in that particular context, what it allows us uh, and our customers to do is take Casting K10 and in addition to having object storage or NFS as a target repository for the secure backups we were talking about a moment earlier, we can also now go ahead and have that sent to VBR. And the benefits of that is a lot of customers obviously have made an investment in VBR and the uh, workflows around it, whether it's because of the tiered storage with HP Apollo or Cisco 3260s or Dell EMC data domains. So not only do we get to have VBR support a variety of different types of workloads, not just hypervisor, but now Kubernetes application uh, volume data, but you also get to leverage your investments uh, in a lot of these um, uh, popular backup targets that VBR has already been integrated into. So I think that's another one which we're quite excited about. Girish, thank you so much for joining me today. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Always a pleasure, uh, Sopna. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to uh, the next time.